Greeting students, this is Ms. Suswana from Hearts Bande Tivet College in Stanerton Campus. Today's lesson will come from food preparation level 3, topic 3, which is the basic cakes and biscuits. So the subject outcomes that we are going to cover, they are four. The first one, cleaning the preparation areas before and after use. The second one, understanding the main contamination threats when preparing the cakes and biscuits. Uh, number three, identifying the different types of cakes and biscuit products. Number four, identifying the different preparation methods. So we'll start with cleaning of preparation areas and equipment before use, which is unit one. So it is important to make sure that we clean our preparation areas before use, including the equipment, because we're trying to avoid the cross-contamination of bacteria and also food poisoning. So how do we clean the preparation area before use? Um, these areas that we are going to use should be clean with no visible signs of food particles. That means you need to have your cloth to remove any visible signs of food particles from your preparation area. Number two, you'll be using, for example, when we do baking, we use big uh, equipment, mixing equipment, as well as utensils, the mixing bowls, the cloth, as well as cooking containers. You need to make sure that they are clean. How do we clean them? We use the hot water and detergent. Then after washing them with the hot water and detergent, we rinse them with hot water in order to destroy the microorganisms. Then all the equipments must be cleaned in accordance with the minimum principles and practices of the organization. Each and every organization has got its own principles. So make sure that you follow those principles. Then the hands must be washed before and after preparation because we are trying to avoid the cross-contamination of bacteria. Then as you'll be using the chopping boards, you need to make sure that uh, you scrub well in order to prevent the transfer of odors as well as bacteria. Because sometimes when we prepare for baking, we use fruits of which we chop the fruits on the chopping boards. So we need to make sure that we scrub them well. Then make sure that you don't use the cracked or chipped bowls because the cracked and chipped bowls, they contain the bacteria in their cracks. Then you need to rinse the equipment carefully after sanitizing. Then the cleaning routine should be established for all the larger pieces of equipment. And also you need to make sure that you, you've got a clean supply of spoons, scrapers, scoops, and also disposable gloves ready. That is cleaning the preparation area before use. Then when we clean the preparation area, there are three key steps that we need to follow. Number one, step number one, you wipe the spilled or splashed food immediately. Then secondly, you clean with detergent and hot water, you sanitize or you rinse with hot water. Then you use a dry cloth to dry the area or you allow it to air dry. Then we also need to clean the preparation area and equipment at the end of the day as you'll be preparing your cakes or your biscuits. Then at the end of the day or at the end of your shift, you need to make sure that the preparation areas are left clean as well as the equipment. So how do we clean the preparation area and equipment at the end of the day? Number one, a cleaning routine should be established for all the preparation area, cooking areas, and equipment that we use in the kitchen. In the kitchen, we use the electrical equipment. 
So you need to make sure that the power to all the electrical equipment is turned off. Then the preparation areas and equipments that are used should be left clean. The mixing bowls that you that, um, will be using should be washed separately from pots and pans. Then make sure that you use the detergent. Then the baking trays or the baking pans should be cleaned and thoroughly dried in order to avoid the rust. Then lastly, all the preparation areas, the cooking areas and equipment must be cleaned in accordance with the minimum principles of health, safety and hygiene regulations. Because in the kitchen or in the hospitality industry, we are concerned about the health and also the safety of our customers. So we need to make sure that we follow those regulations when we clean. Then how do we ensure that the cleaning is not neglected? Number one, you need to draw up a schedule. The schedule will list the four things. Number one, the items that need to be cleaned, how often they must be cleaned, how they must be cleaned and who must clean them. So you need to make sure that you draw up a schedule. Then, how is it important to keep the preparation area and storage area in a hygienic order? Number one, to comply with the food hygiene regulations. There are regulations that guide us in the hospitality industry, especially in the kitchen because uh, it's where we prepare food. Number two is to prevent the transfer of food, poisoning bacteria to food. Number three is to prevent the pest infestation. Number four is to prevent the contamination of food. Then if you, uh, if you are ill with any infectious disease, you need to stay at home because we don't want you to spread it to your co-workers and also our customers. Then all the equipment which comes into contact with food should be taken apart and cleaned after use. So in order to maintain a high standard of hygiene in the kitchen, it is important that you wash your hands. When do you wash our hands? After, toilet, uh, after visiting the toilet, after blowing your nose or touching your face, after smoking a cigarette, after handling money, and also after handling rubbish. So unhygienic preparation, cooking and storage areas and equipment will result in, if your kitchen is not clean, what will happen? If your preparation area is not clean, or the uh, utensils that you, you will be using are not clean, what will happen? The mixtures will go off, there will be multiplication of bacteria in the kitchen which will cause food poisoning. Then you will produce poor quality cakes. Then unit two, the contamination threats, the main contamination threats. Cross-contamination can occur between cooked and uncooked food during storage. So it is important to make sure that when you store your food in the refrigerator, you store them separately, you store the cooked and uncooked food separately in order to avoid cross-contamination. Number two, uh, the food poisoning can be transferred. So it is important to make sure that when you store your food in the refrigerator or any storage area, you cover your food. Then the special care must be taken when dealing with high-risk food. I can give you the examples of the high-risk food that we use during baking. It can be milk, it can be cream, uh, it can be butter, it can be eggs. So food poisoning may be transferred from yourself to the food. So if you've got any open cuts, if you've got sores, if you are sneezing, you've got cold, sore throat, or any or, or dirty hands, are uh, all possible sources. So you need to make sure that if you've got open cuts, you cover them. If you've got sores, you cover them. If you've got any infectious disease or, or infections like flu, 
calls then you report. Then the contamination will occur if the f uh, flower or foods are allowed to come into contact with the rodents. Food poisoning bacteria may be transferred through dirty surfaces and equipment. Cross-contamination can occur if equipment is not cleaned correctly between the operation. Cross-contamination can occur if frozen doors are not defrosted correctly. Contamination can occur if products are stored in, uh, in, at incorrect temperatures. Then incorrect waste disposal can also lead to contamination. So unit three will be talking about the different types of cakes and biscuits. Then we've got the most common ingredients that we use when we prepare the cakes and biscuits. Number one, we've got flour. And number two, the fats or shortening. Number um, three, sugar. Four, the eggs. Five, liquid. The liquid, it can be milk or it can be water. So let us talk about flour. The wheat flour is most commonly used for cake and biscuit making. Then the rye flour may be used for gingerbread. The rice flour is commonly found in shortbread to give the crispness. So number two, the second ingredient we said, the shortening or the fats. The, the functions of shortening in your baked product, number one, they add flavor, color, and richness. Then during mixing, the fat coats the gluten protein and stop them from sticking together and forming a tough mixture. Then we've got other functions of fats in baked products. The fats, they tenderize the product and soften the texture. They add moisture and richness. They keep the quality of your baked product. They add flavor. They also act as a leavening agent. How do they work as a leavening agent? During the creaming method or during the whisking method. You are still going to talk about the preparation methods that we use uh, for making, for preparing the cakes and biscuits. Then the sugar. The sugar improves flavor. It gives a golden brown color. The sugar contributes to the following characteristics tenderness and moisture, lightness, and also browning. Then we've got different types of sugar. It can be the white granulated sugar, it can be the brown sugar, it can be the icing sugar, it can be the um, caster sugar. Then uh, the fourth most common ingredient is the eggs. The functions of eggs, they give the structure to the baked product. They act as a leavening agent. Then the fat in egg yolk also act as a shortening. They add flavor, they add the nutritional value, they add color. The egg yolks, they contain the natural emulsifier, which helps to produce a smooth, better. Then the whole egg, it contains 70% of water. Then egg whites, they contain 86% of water and the egg yolks, they contain about 49% of water. So which means the eggs, they add liquid to the better. So we said the eggs, number one, they contain fats. Number two, they contain water. So the eggs, they can act as a, a liquid. Then number five, the liquid, we said the liquid, it can be water, the liquid, it can be milk. The liquid can, be, uh, okay, the gluten cannot be developed without moisture. That means what is a gluten? A gluten, it is a protein that we get in flour. It is only developed once you add the liquid. So the liquid, it plays a major role during baking. The liquid uh, in doughs or batters changes to steam during baking and also it contributes to leavening agent. Then the second one, we said it's milk. The milk contributes to texture, to flavor, nutritional value, keeping the quality, 
crust, uh, it also forms, uh, it also helps in the formation of the crust of, the, of your baked product. Then when adding milk to cake or biscuit mixtures, it is important to read the recipe carefully so that you can be uh, sure of the temperature and also you can be sure of the correct method. Then the milk products, you can use the whole or skimmed milk, you can use the buttermilk, you can use the dry milk solids. Then we also have the leavening agents. The leavening agents, they are divided into three. We've got chemical leavening agent, we've got natural leavening agent, and also the biological leavening agent. So, we said the leavening agent, they are divided or they are classified into three. So, we've got the chemical raising agent. The, so the examples of chemical raising agents, it can, it can be baking powder, bicarbonate of soda, and cream of tartar. Then the natural raising agent, it's air and steam, the biological raising agent, the example, it's yeast. So now we'll talk about the chemical raising agent. Sodium bicarbonate or bicarbonate of soda or the baking powder, that means under the chemical raising agent we've got sodium bicarbonate or we call it bicarbonate of soda or baking powder and also a cream of tartar. So it is the simplest raising agent, it tends to leave a strong flavor and yellow dis uh, coloration. It is alkaline chemical. When mixed with acid in a moisture-rich environment, it reacts to produce carbon dioxide. Then the ratios of acid ingredients used with a bicarbonate of soda. So if you'll be using 2,5 mils of bicarbonate of soda, you will have 250 mils of buttermilk of which the buttermilk, it falls under the dairy products. Number two, if you will be using um, five mils of bicarbonate of soda, you will use 250 mils of the golden syrup or the molasses. Then if you'll be using five mils of bicarbonate of soda, we'll be using 12,5 mils of vinegar or lemon juice. Then the baking powder, it is the mixture of alkali and acid. A good baking powder does not affect the color or the taste of food. It consists of bicarbonate of soda and cream of tartar. Then the natural raising agent, we said we've got air and steam. Then uh, the air is incorporated into batter by two methods, that is by creaming method and whisking method. So this expands air during baking and leavens the product. Creaming is the process of beating the fat and sugar together to incorporate uh, air. Then the forming is the process or the whisking, it is the process of beating eggs with or without sugar to incorporate air. Then the steam, when the water tends uh, to steam, it expands to 1,600 times its original uh, volume. All baked product contain moisture because we use liquid, of which we said the liquid, it can be water or milk, of which it makes the steam an important leavening agent. Then we've got the examples of baked products that use the steam as a leavening agent with cream puffs, Swiss roll, puff pastry, Pop overs as well as the pie crust. The biological raising agent is, we said it's, uh, it's a yeast. It is a microscopic plant. Through fermentation, it acts on carbohydrates and changes them into, bicarbon, in, in, into uh, carbon dioxide, gas, and alcohol. So this release of gas produces leavening action in these products. So we've got other ingredients that we use or that we use as uh, flavorings it can it's number one it's salt the salt it improves the flavor of sweet and savory products the second one is chocolate or cocoa we can also use the nuts we can also use fruit 
Then we've got other ingredients that we use during baking. It's honey, it's cream, essence, spices, and also alcohol. Then we've got quality points that we need to look for when we select the ingredients for biscuits and cakes. Number one, we'll talk about flour. So we said the flour, it contains gluten. That means we've got different types of flour. We've got the strong flour, which co contains gluten, uh, a lot of gluten, and also we've got the weak flour. So it depends on the product that you are going to prepare. You need to make sure that you select the right flour. So we spoke about the gluten. We said a gluten, it is a protein that we get in flour. It is only developed when you add liquid. Then number two, the fats, we said they improve flavor, but make sure that your fats are not expired. And also you need to check um, the, 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 the smell of, of your fats. Then uh, the sugar, the sugar, it comes in different um, types. We've got the white granulated sugar, the custard sugar, the brown sugar, uh, the honey, and also the golden syrup. The eggs, make sure that your eggs are fresh. They are of A-grade uh, quality, and they should be at room temperature. Then make sure that you pay special care when you are dividing your eggs. The milk should be fresh. Then we've got types of milk. We've got powdered milk, evaporated milk, low fat, condensed milk, buttermilk. Make sure that you check the expiry dates. Then the chocolates, we said we also use the chocolates. The chocolates, we've got different types of chocolates. We've got a bitter sweet chocolate, semi-sweet chocolate, white chocolate, dark chocolate, milk chocolate. Then Make sure that your chocolate is fresh and smells sweet. Then the nuts may be natural or blanched. They can be chopped, slivered, flaked. Make sure that your nuts are fresh. Make sure that you keep your nuts well rubbed and should be stored in the refrigerator. Then we also use the oil, the spices and flavorings. So make sure that the containers are well closed. You, uh, you also, you, you are not allowed to keep them for too long. And also the flavor is best if, you're, if they are fresh. Then the quantity. During baking, you need to make sure that the ingredients, they are measured carefully, even for small quantities. How do we measure our ingredients? You can use the measuring jugs. You can use the measuring cups. You can use the measuring spoons as well as the, the, the measuring scale. Then identifying the different types of cakes and biscuits. The cakes are referred to as light, rich, heavy, and dense. They are, they are the, an indication of the amount of shortening of fat that has been used. Light product has no fat. It consists of mostly the eggs, sugar, and flour, such as Swiss, Swiss roll. Then we also have the dense cake, such as a rich fruit cake. Lightness or density of baked product will influence how to prepare the baking tin, the temperature of the oven, as well as the baking period. So we'll talk about the cakes. The cakes, they are classified according to the ingredients used and the mixing method. Cakes without fat or leavening agent, so the examples of the cakes without fat or the leavening agent is the Swiss roll. Then also we've got the cakes that contains fat or oil and chemical raising agent, which is the feather cake and also the chiffon cake. Okay, now we're talking about cakes. We said the cakes are classified according to the ingredients used and the mixing method. So we've got the cakes without fat or leavening agent. 
So we've got an example of uh, the cakes without fat or leavening agent, which is the Swiss roll. For example, when we prepare the Swiss roll, we don't use the leavening agent. How do we prepare the Swiss roll? We use the eggs as a leavening agent. We whisk the eggs, we use the whisking method. So, and also we don't add the shortening. Then we've got uh, the cakes that contain fat or oil and the chemical leavening agent, which is number one, it's a feather cake, a chiffon cake, as well as the short cake or the pound cake. Then the mixing methods that we have, we've got a creaming method, we've got a whisking method or a forming method, a folding method, um, melting method, as well as the rubbing in method. Then how do we prepare the mixing method? We start by creaming the fat and also add the sugar. We cream together the fat and sugar, then we add eggs little by little and we add the dry ingredients. That is the creaming method. The forming or whisking method, we whisk the eggs. It's either with or without sugar until they form a foam. The melting method, it's whereby we melt the butter then we add the dry ingredients. The folding in method, it's whereby we mix the two prepared mixture, mixtures together. Then we've got the rubbing in method, it's whereby we rub the dry ingredients as well as fats together until they form something like breadcrumbs. Those are the five preparation methods that we use for cakes and biscuits the types of biscuits. We've got four, uh, seven procedures for the makeup of biscuits. We've got the dropped biscuits, the baked biscuits, the rolled biscuits, the molded biscuits, the refrigerated biscuits, the bar biscuits, as well as the sheet biscuits. From our lesson, we have covered these following outcomes, the cleaning, uh, cleaning the preparation areas before and after you. So, as uh, for now, we all know on how to clean the preparation areas. We know the main contamination threats. We know the different types of cakes and biscuits, as well as their preparation method. For any further questions, you can hit me up at GS College uh, social media platforms or in Standard Campus. Thank you very much.